right. Well, I'm excited to be up here. I do love getting to come up and, and share uh, the, me- the messages, the gospel with you guys. Uh, it's, it's something I really enjoy doing, and, and I'm glad it's going to hopefully be a larger part of my new position here, because Mickey does like to take some time off from time to time, and I am excited to get to step up and, uh, and fill in for him. So I'm going to be speaking the next two weeks, uh, and we are going to be talking about uh, this week being ready, and then next week being willing. And so for what, you ask, right? So for what? What are we getting ready for? What are we going to be willing to do? Well, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. We believe, the staff here, me, Mickey, Kim, Dustin, and I, and the leadership, we believe that, that uh, really this summer we're gearing up for something amazing. We believe that there's going to be a movement of the Holy Spirit within our church to reach our community, and we are excited about that. We're excited about the changes that are going to be coming with life groups, with what we do on Sunday mornings, with, uh, with the way we, we work our volunteer ministry, with the way we're going to reach our community. We've got some really exciting things that are going to be starting. And we believe wholeheartedly, and if we didn't, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing, but we believe that God is getting ready to do something amazing through our church to reach our community. And we're excited to be a part of that. But in order for that to happen... We, as a group of believers, as a group of people who call ourselves Christians and call Community Life Church our home, we have to be ready and we have to be willing when the call comes. And so that's what we're going to be talking about the next two weeks, is being ready and being willing. There's a great story in the book of Joshua about a woman named Rahab. We've all heard this story, we all know it, but Joshua sent his spies in to where? If you know the story, you may pay attention. Where? Jericho, right? Everybody's favorite wrestler, Chris Jericho, the walls of Jericho. Sorry, that's a different, that's for the younger generation. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> he, sent his, he sent his spies into Jericho to scope out the people, to scope out the land, to see, are we going to be able to take this city or not? And they happen upon this woman named Rahab, and Rahab recognizes who they are. She recognizes that they are Israelites, and she says, I believe that your God The God of Israel is the God of everything. I believe that. And I know that if your God says that you're going to take Jericho, then that's what's going to happen. And she says, I will keep you safe tonight if you will promise that when you come into the city, me and my family will be protected. And they make a deal where they say, that's fine. For protecting us now, we will protect you later. As long as you hang a red cord out the window that we go out of so that we know which house is yours. And if you do that, then whenever God moves and comes into the city to allow us to take it, you and whoever is inside of your house will be spared. That's the only thing she has to do. And so as soon as the spies go out that window, what does she do? Immediately puts a red cord in that window because she's not an idiot. They tell her, God is going to come in and destroy this city, and the only thing that is going to keep you safe is, this, is if you put this red cord in your window. She doesn't know when God's coming. It could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could be months from now. But the point is, is she didn't want to miss it. She wanted to make sure she was ready when the moment happened. So as soon as they left her house, she puts that cord up in her window because she doesn't want to miss it. For her, it's life and death. She's not going to miss this movement of God because she's ready, because she's ready immediately. And she understood something that we all need to understand, is that when God moves, God moves suddenly. It happens immediately. It's like one day we're walking along and nothing's happening, and then all of a sudden, bam, God moves, and it's time to go. And if you're not ready, you're going to get left behind. Now, we're not talking about rapture stuff. I'm talking about movements here on the earth. But when this church is called to go, when God comes in and says, it's time to move now, if you're not ready, then you're going to be left behind. And you're not going to get to experience all the great things that this church is going to do. That's going to happen. And we don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen to any of us. You see, every single one of us have an important part to play in this thing that we think God is about to start 
doing. If we're not able to do that, then we're going to miss out. Our church is going to miss out. Our community is going to miss out. So we have to be ready. So what's going to keep us from being ready? We're going to talk about that today. We've got to talk about what it is that's going to keep us from being ready to move when God says move. Now most of you know that, that over last summer and then through the, the new year here, my wife and I moved to Tulsa to, to pursue a business opportunity. And it went okay, it just wasn't for us. But there, essentially what I was doing was pulling oil out of fryers and filtering it. It was pretty gross, it was pretty nasty. I got burns all over me from it. Uh, but then I would take it to a storage unit and I would pump it out of my van into the storage unit so somebody else could come get it. Well, the way the storage unit worked, we had a sliding door on this side of the van, and the storage unit was over here, but the van, like, leaned this way. And so my opening's over here, but all the oil would flow to this side, so I couldn't get it all out. So I, was, I couldn't get enough of the oil out to be able to do my job. So me, being as, as amazingly smart as I am, I was like, I've got a, a, a fix for this. I'm going to park the van the other direction, so that all the oil leans this way and I can pump it out, right? Genius, genius. So they forgot to take any of the oil out before I did that. And so as soon as I unscrewed the top and got it loose just enough, all of the oil came exploding out the top of the thing, all over the concrete, all over everywhere. It was the worst start to a day you could possibly have. I spent the next three hours throwing kitty litter on the ground and sweeping it up. It was terrible. It was terrible. That oil only needed a small, tiny little crack, a small, tiny little open to explode everywhere and release God knows what all over the place. It was nasty. It was disgusting. Now, the reason I tell you this is because we need to understand that the one who's going to hold us back from being ready to do what God wants us to do is our enemy. It is Satan. And Satan only needs a small crack to get into your life and blow it wide open. He only needs one tiny foothold to do what it is that he wants to do, which is to tear you down, to destroy you, and make it so you can't do what God wants you to do. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. Satan wants to destroy you. He may do it slowly, he may do it quickly, but that is his one job on this earth. And so we have to be ready so that when that move of God comes, we can go with him. And the only way to do that is to make sure that Satan does not have a foothold in our life. And so today we're going to look at four areas of our life, four different ways that Satan can use to get a foothold in our life. Now what Satan's going to try to do is he's going to isolate you. Satan wants you isolated from the rest of your family, from the rest of your church, from the rest of your community. He wants you isolated because he knows once you're isolated, you're vulnerable. See, when we're together, when we're in community, we can protect each other. We can guard each other's weak spots. But once you're out on your own, it becomes dangerous because you don't have anybody watching your back. You don't have anybody helping you out. That's when you're vulnerable is when you're isolated, and that's what Satan wants to do. In 1 Peter 5.8, we're going to read this. It says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Be sober, be vigilant, because our adversary prowls around like a lion, seeking he or that which he may devour. That's what Satan's trying to do. He wants to devour us. So let's look at this verse real quick. Be sober, be vigilant. What does that mean? Well, first of all, those two words speak to immediacy. This isn't like be sober in the future, be vigilant in the future, because Satan may come one day. When these words are being spoken, there is an immediacy to them that this has to happen right now. This has to happen right now. Be sober, be vigilant. What be sober means is don't give in to the passions and the desires of your heart. It's not saying that anything is necessarily wrong, but it is saying you need to keep those passions and those desires under control. Keep them to where you are sober so that you can do what you need to do. Be vigilant, like a, like a shepherd watching his flock. Be vigilant. Keep a, a lookout for what's going on. And that's what we have to do. 
Because our adversary, the devil, walks around like what? Like a roaring lion. It's a terrifying imagery. And it's supposed to be terrifying for a reason, because we need to understand the gravity of who he is and what he wants to do. He is actively looking to destroy us, and we have to guard against that. We have to guard against that. Now, in the wild, how do animals protect themselves from the lions? They use a herd. They are herd animals, and they use a herd because it protects the weaker animals. It protects the weaker animals. It protects the the ones that are sick, the ones that are old, the ones that are ill, the ones that are young. It helps protect them from the lion. And that's what a church is. We should be here to protect one another from our adversary, the lion. That's part of what a church does. That's part of what we should be doing with our life groups, with the community part of our name. We're protecting one another. But we can't do that if you isolate yourself. We can't do that if you allow the enemy to pull you away from what's going on and isolate yourself. We have to be sober. We have to be vigilant or our enemy is going to take us away. So how do we combat this isolation? Well, first we have to understand how Satan is going to isolate us. There's four ways that we're going to talk about today that Satan is going to isolate us with. The first one is he's going to isolate us by telling us lies. He's going to tell us lies about the people around us, about ourselves, about God. He's going to tell us lies. In John chapter 8, verse 44, it says, You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's what Satan does. He lies to you. There's nothing that is going to come out of Satan's mouth that is the truth. He is impossible for him to speak the truth. He is the father of lies. It is his native tongue. That's who he is. He is a liar. So what lies is he going to tell us? What lies do we have to look out for? He'll lie to us. He'll say, you're not wanted and you're not needed. You're not wanted and you're not needed. I'm sure some of us have heard that lie before about church, about relationships, about family. You're not wanted and you're not needed. And the truth is, is you are always wanted and you are always needed. Nobody likes you anyway. Nobody likes you anyway. That's a lie that Satan tells us. And the truth is, so there's probably some people that don't like you, but the majority of people do. And it's okay that some people don't like you. A lot of people don't like me. That's okay. The majority of the people do like you. You are not qualified. You're not qualified to do that job. The truth is you don't have to be qualified. You just have to be willing. You just have to be willing to go and do what God wants you to do. There's no place for you here. The truth is, is, is there's always a place for you here. You can't do anything right. The truth is you do lots of things right. You don't do everything right, but you do lots of stuff right. You have nothing to offer. The truth is you have a ton to offer. You can't trust God or the tr- church. And the truth is you can trust God and you can trust his people because we're here to help you. We're here to protect you. The word of God is not true. And the truth is the word of God is the absolute truth and can be trusted. Satan knows this. That's why he's lying to you and telling you that it's not true. Because he knows it is and he can't do anything other than lie. Satan is stronger than God and the truth is Satan is not even equal with God. Satan was created by God. He's nowhere near the equal of God. Don't believe that lie. Satan is not real. He's not a threat. This is a lie that Satan likes to use, especially today. I'm not real, guys. I'm made up. I'm made up. I'm like Valentine's Day. I'm just made up, right? It's just so that the card companies can make lots of money. I'm not real. The truth is, Satan is very real. He's a very large danger to our life. We cannot believe that lie in our culture that Satan is not real, because he is. God just wants you to be happy. We hear that, that lie a lot. We hear that lie from certain pulpits a lot of the time. And the truth is, God wants you to grow, and growth comes through trial. God wants you to be joyful, not happy. There's a difference. There's a difference. 
Church is not important. The truth is, church is the body of Christ. It's the hope of the world. We, we, are, we are the body of Christ here on this earth. It's incredibly important. You have plenty of time to obey God. The truth is, you don't know when your time's up. You don't know when it's over. And you don't know when God's going to move. You don't want to miss that movement because you're not ready. There is no judgment. I hear that lie a lot. There's no judgment. You can't judge me. Nobody can judge me. And the truth is, yes, there will be judgment. There will be judgment for all of us, for believers, for non-believers alike. Judgment is coming, and it will happen. Do not believe that lie. God hates me, and the truth is, you're the apple of his eye. God doesn't heal anymore, and he would never heal me anyway. And the truth is, God still heals, God still delivers, and God still moves in our life. He still does. We have to believe the truth. We cannot believe the lie. I have to be perfect. The truth is, nobody expects you to be perfect. In fact, if you're perfect, you're not allowed in here anyway. Remember? No perfect people allowed. That's what the church is. It's a bunch of people who aren't perfect, but who are submitting to God. And the last lie, nothing I do matters, and the truth is, you matter. You may, ma- you may not be doing anything that's of worth, but that doesn't mean that you don't matter and you don't have the potential to do things that matter. Those are lies that Satan will tell us to get into our head to help isolate us from the rest of our community. If we believe those lies, we start to get bitter, we start to get angry, we start to turn away from those who love us. We can't allow that to happen. Get rid of the lies in your life. There are lies being believed right now in this room that have to be gone. You have to get rid of them. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. I can't stand up here and tell you every lie that Satan is telling you every moment of every day. That's between you and God. And so when you feel a lie, you take it to God. You take it to his word. You look at scripture and see what scripture says about the truth. It's between you and Jesus whether or not you're going to believe those lies. But I can tell you that if you are believing those lies, it's going to be painful. You're going to go down a path that you don't want to go down. Don't believe the lies that Satan tells us. The second thing that Satan's going to try to do is he's going to try to oppress us through fear. He's going to try to oppress us through fear. He's going to use these lies to put doubt in our mind and doubt in our spirit. And he's going to try to oppress us through fear. Hebrews 2.15 says, And free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. We cannot be afraid of death. We cannot be afraid of, of being persecuted. We cannot be afraid of reprisals from culture. We can't be afraid of those things. Satan will tell you, if you speak out, they're not going to like you anymore. If you speak out against this, then there may be consequences. He's going to try to keep you afraid from doing what it is that you're supposed to do. Fear oppresses our spirit. We were not given a spirit of fear. Fear comes from our enemy. And when you cast off fear, it's a great feeling. I remember growing up, going to the lake, and climbing to the top of the rock quarry and being like, I'm going to jump off, but I'm scared. But I want to jump off, but I'm scared. In that moment when you finally cast off the fear and you leap into the water, it's one of the coolest feelings in the entire world. And that's what God wants for us every single day. We cannot be oppressed by the fear of our enemy. In this room today, there are leaps of faith that need to be made. There are changes that need to be made in your life, whether it be with your job. Maybe it's time to propose to that person, but you're afraid. Maybe it's time to change your job, but you're afraid. Maybe it's time to take a step out and be more active in our community, but you're afraid of what people are going to say. There are leaps of faith that need to be made today in this room. And if you submit to God and you ask him to take this fear, this oppression that's holding your spirit back, then he will help you 
take that leap. It's going to be scary. It's going to be blind. It's going to be like coming off the, the roof of a house and trying to find that first rung on the ladder again. It's a terrifying feeling. But once you find it, God's got you. He's going to take care of you. Do not be oppressed by fear. The third thing that Satan is going to try to do to isolate you from the rest of your community is through the bondage of sin. Through the bondage of sin. In Joshua chapter 7, there's there's a powerful story uh, about Israel, and this is what it said. It says, the Lord said to Joshua, stand up, what are you doing down in your face? Joshua was ashamed because Israel had just lost a battle. And he's laying on his face in the dirt, probably crying and weeping and, and wishing to die. And God says, get up. He says, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. See, what happened was, when Israel was marching on their way to the promised land, they would come across these cities that were their enemies, and God would say, I will deliver this city into your hands, but once that is done, you have to go through, you have to destroy everything. Do not keep the livestock, do not keep the gold, do not keep the grain, keep nothing. It is not worthy of you. And so they would go in, and for the most part, every now and then, they would do what they were supposed to do. But like all of us, a lot of times, they wouldn't be able to keep from, from bowing that temptation of keeping just a little bit. Let me keep this gold, let me keep this jewelry, let me keep this food. We could use this. And you know, off topic a little bit, I think it speaks pretty heavily to the heart of a man who is not obeying God, that whenever they went into those cities, that God said, you need to destroy the men, the women, the children, the animals, the jewelry, all of that stuff. When they went into those cities, they decided to keep the treasure and not the children. And even though God had commanded them, you need to destroy it all. And there was a reason for that. There was a reason for that. It was the treasure that tempted the man and not the life I think that speaks pretty heavily to the heart of a, of a person that is not walking in the heart of God. Because that's what they were doing right here. They were not walking in the heart of God. And so, God says, until you destroy that which seeks destruction, you will not be able to withstand your enemy. And that's what happens in our life. As Christians, we give our life over to God we ask Jesus to forgive us our sins, and he does. It's great. But then, after a while, the devil comes back, and he tries to oppress us. He tries to isolate us. He tries to do these things, and we're not able to resist him. The reason we're not able to resist him is because we're holding on to sin in our life. See, sin is bondage, and it will hold you back. And just like with the Israelites, we cannot... We cannot resist our enemy, the devil, when we are holding on to secret sin in our life. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. There's sin that needs to be given over to God. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's drinking. Maybe it's an affair. Maybe it's uh, gluttony. Maybe, whatever it is. Whatever it is that you hold on to that's more valuable to you than God that's bondage, and it's going to hold you back from what God wants you to do. It's going to isolate you from your community. See, all these things, they kind of add on to one another. You hold on to sins in your life. You believe lies that Satan tells you, and those lies cause you to be fearful of coming forth and confessing your sin to God because you think, what's God going to do to me when he finds out what I'm doing? And the truth is, God already knows what you're doing. It's why you can't resist your enemy now because you're not doing what you're not, do, you're not supposed to be doing. Now listen, I cannot guarantee you that if you are walking with God, that you will be blessed the way you want to. There's no guarantee of that. But I can guarantee you that if you are not walking with God, and you are in the bondage of sin, that you will not get the blessing that God wants to give you. 
That is a guarantee. And so you give up that sin that's hidden in your heart. You cannot resist your enemy. And then the fourth thing, and this one was hard, guys. I went back and forth on this one. This one's hard. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. And I'm reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, Woe to the world because of offenses. This is Jesus talking. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offenses come. Now what Jesus is talking about here is is that part of of Scripture where he's talking about uh, when you keep the little ones away from me. When something you do keeps the little ones from coming to me, those who I love from getting to me, he says it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and tossed in the ocean than what's going to come in judgment, if that's what you're doing. And so these offenses that we're talking about, what is this? And this was hard for me because you got to look at it from two different perspectives. You look at it from the offender and the offended. And it's hard to wrap my mind around this. But guys, this is a huge, huge deal. Jesus is saying, woe to the man by whom offenses come. It's not a good thing to be woed in the Bible. It's never a good thing when God or Jesus says, woe unto you. You better pay attention to what's happening because it's not going to end well. It is a big deal. It is life and death, the offenses that we place on another person's heart. Now, let me be clear. In a body of believers, we are not talking about sinful issues. If I go out and I get wasted at a bar and somebody sees me and they come and they say, you shouldn't be doing the job you're doing until you get this figured out, and I become offended by that, that is not offense, ladies and gentlemen. That is conviction. That is different. In matters of sin, this does not apply. And this does not apply when we're talking about people who are not believers. We should be offensive to our world. Our beliefs should run askew of what they're doing in their life. And that is also called conviction when that happens. What we are talking about are are things that are not sin. Matters that are not sinful. Because there are disagreements. There are different ways of doing things. And that can cause offense. And we have to figure out how to get around that and understand that that cannot happen within our community. And I'll tell you why. Jesus says that the one who is offended, that offense, if it stays in their heart, turns into hate. And when you hate your brother, Jesus relates that to murdering your brother. And so when I cause offense to someone and it causes them to hate me, then Jesus says that in their heart they have already committed murder. They have become a murderer because of something that I may have said or done. That is how big a deal offense is. Now, I am the first one to tell somebody who gets their feelings hurt, you need to get over it. And to some degree, yes, you need to get over There are things that are not worth getting offended about. But if I am the one who offends them, then I need to go to them. I need to seek forgiveness. I need to explain myself and say, I'm sorry. I did not mean to offend you. I did not mean to hurt you because I do not want them harboring hate in their heart because that tears them away from God and it tears me away from God. And we can't have that. We can't have that. We have to get rid of the offenses in our life. And guys, the next six months of our life are going to be full of offense. We're trying to elect a president for a country that's halfway down to crap town anyway, and it's going to get offensive. It is possible to be a Christian and vote Democrat. It's possible. We don't like to, we don't like to say that. It's possible to not be a Christian and vote Republican. It's possible. And so what we're going to do is we're going to hold on to these ideologies about Democrat or Republican. And inside this church, there are going to be people who are going to be offended because one person votes one way or another. That is not an issue of sin. It's not a sin to vote Democrat. It's not a sin to vote Republican. And so we're going to have to be very careful over the next six months about how we approach those issues. 
If you have to get off Facebook, get off Facebook for the next six months. If you cannot control yourself on the Facebook, get off of it. On Twitter, on whatever social media you're on where it's given you a place to say exactly what you feel about a certain person, get off of it if the temptation is too strong. Get off of it if the stuff you're reading causes you offense. Don't read it. But we have to be very careful, really throughout our life, but especially these next six months. Now, when does offense occur? Offense occurs when somebody says something too harshly or too hateful or, or they ask you to do something that maybe you don't want to do and you get offended by that. And so how, do we, how are we careful? Well, first of all, we speak the truth in, in hate, right? Spitefully. I'm right and you're wrong. We don't do that, do we? We speak the truth in love. Because love covers a whole lot of stuff. A whole lot of stuff. We speak the truth in love. Whenever we got to tell somebody, man, I think you're messing up. And this is why. And I want to help you through it. And the second thing is, is when somebody offends you, you need to go to that person and say, hey, that hurt my feelings. And if it's me, I'm going to be like, what are feelings? But you go to that person and you say, you hurt my feelings. You hurt my spirit. I was offended by what you said. And that person has the opportunity to ask your forgiveness. And you have an opportunity to mend that relationship and get over it and move on. Because that's what we have to do. We have to get over it. It's not easy sometimes, but there are ways to go about doing that. So don't cause offense to your brothers and sisters in Christ. So, one, don't believe the lies. Don't believe the lies that Satan tells you. Two, we got to be released from the suppression of fear that Satan's going to put on our spirit. Number three, we have to get rid of the bondage of sin that's in our life. And number four, we have to be careful that we're not offending others. And we have to be careful that we're not being offended by others. And when we are, we have to go to that person and make it right. We've got to make it right. And if we do those four things, if we're, if we're aware of those four things, and we're not letting those lies creep in, we're not letting that oppression creep in, we're not holding on to that sin, we're not holding on to those offenses, then we're able to do what it says in James chapter 4, verse 7. It says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If the devil does not have a, a hand hold in your life, then you are ready to move when God says it's time to move. Because those handholds are going to isolate you from the community. They're going to make you cower in fear. They're going to make you hesitant to move when God wants you to move. So we have to resist the devil so that he'll flee from us. And that starts with submission to God. Submission to God. I told you guys about who Satan was there at the beginning in 1 Peter 5 because you need to understand that he's a very dangerous enemy for a believer. Very dangerous. In fact, in the book of, of Jude, it talks about Michael, the, arch, the archangel, like the sword of God, the hammer of God, essentially, facing off against Satan, and he didn't do it on his own. The first thing he did was he submitted himself to God, and then God came in and fought that battle for him. You will not be able to resist Satan on your own. It's not going to happen. You have to submit to God. Submit to God. Then you resist the devil, and then he flees from you. And guess what? He's not going to flee forever, because he wants you. He wants to take you down. So he'll run away for a little bit and tuck his tail, but he's going to come back, because he knows where you're weak. He knows where you struggle. He knows where you hurt. He knows which lies you believe. He knows which things can oppress you. He knows which sins will put you back in bondage. He knows how to offend you. He knows how to hurt your feelings. He knows how to do all that stuff. He will come back. And what do we do when he comes back? We submit to God, resist him, and he flees from us. We do it over and over and over and over. So what we do. So we cannot be isolated. We cannot pull ourselves away from our community. We cannot allow Satan to pull us away from our community. Because when he does, that's when we're vulnerable. That's when our cracks are exposed. 
sorry for that, but it had to be said. Our weaknesses are exposed in those moments. We cannot allow that to happen. If you want to move when God says move, if you want to be ready for that, then you have to protect yourself. You cannot allow Satan to have a foothold in your life. Let's pray.